The topic of this video is trophic efficiency, which refers to the energy transfer between organisms in a food chain or a food web. So we'll spend some time reviewing both food chains and food webs, and then discuss a bit about how energy moves between organisms in those systems. First, we'll review a bit about food chains. A food chain is a linear model that depicts trophic relationships between organisms in an ecosystem and illustrates how nutrients and energy travel through the system as one organism consumes another organism. It's important to note that food chains tend to be oversimplified models um, of natural ecosystems because there is only a single path depicted through the chain from one trophic level to the next, while in reality, the relationships between organisms are generally much more complex than that. However, food chains can be helpful models, especially for the purpose of learning about trophic levels. So in a food chain, each organism occupies a trophic level or energy level. Anytime you see the word trophic, uh, think food or nourishment. Trophic comes from the Greek word that means nourishment. So uh, to sort of cement that idea, let's think about where we may have seen the term troph or trophy before. So think about uh, autotroph versus heterotroph. So an autotroph is capable of producing its own organic molecules. So think nourishment from self, autotroph, um, and then compared with a heterotroph, which has to obtain organic molecules from an outside source, you can think nourishment from another or heterotroph. So um, some terminology there. So a trophic level is essentially where an organism falls in a food chain. So in our food chain that we have depicted here, your first level is, uh, your first trophic level is the producers, sometimes also referred to as primary producers. In our food chain, that's our green algae. The next trophic level up from primary producers is your primary consumer. In this case, our primary consumer is our mollusk. So we've got some nice uh, freshwater snails here. The primary consumer is feeding um, primarily on the primary producer. The next trophic level in our food chain is the secondary consumer. Our example is the slimy sculpin. So we're looking at this fish. Um, this fish is a carnivore that eats primary consumers. So in this case, the sculpin is eating the mollusk and the mollusk is eating the algae. So you get the idea of trophic levels and how they change from one to the next. Um, in our food chain, the last trophic level that we see is our tertiary consumer or our apex consumer. In this case, we're looking at the Chinook salmon. Um, the salmon eats the sculpin, the sculpin eats the mollusk, the mollusk eats the algae. So you can see again that progression. Notice in this case that the salmon is both the apex and the tertiary consumer. So a tertiary consumer is defined as a carnivore that eats other carnivores. Um, and an apex consumer is essentially the top of the food chain. You can um, have one organism that serves as both. It really just depends on how many trophic levels you have in a particular ecosystem. It's not always three or four, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's five. It really just depends on how much energy you have um, available to determine how many trophic levels the ecosystem can actually support. Now let's take a look at an example of a food web. Uh, this food web is showing um, interactions in an ecosystem in Lake Ontario. Um, as you can see, a food web is a more complex depiction of trophic relationships within an ecosystem. It's an interconnected model of all the organisms that are present, different than a food chain, which again is just a linear um, single path from one trophic level to the next. So food webs account for multiple feeding interactions between species in an ecosystem. Um, and because of this, it is a more accurate representation of what goes on in just about every ecosystem. So again, you can see you've got your primary producers at the bottom of the food chain. Then you've got your primary consumers just above that. You've still got your secondary consumers and then your tertiary or your apex 
consumers, your apex predators at the top of the food chain, but in a food web, you actually can see um, the interactions a little bit more clearly. Um, there are, in some cases, organisms that are eating other organisms at, at different trophic levels, as in the case of our opossum shrimp, who is eating both primary consumers, but also, if we follow this green arrow from the bottom, is eating uh, primary producers as well. So food webs are a little bit more intricate, they are more complex in food chains, but in just about every case are a more accurate representation of nutrient and energy flow through the ecosystem. When we talk about trophic efficiency, we are talking about the percentage of energy that is transferred from one trophic level to the next. So how much of the energy that is available to um, the first trophic level, so in this case primary producers, um, energy from the sun in most cases, we're talking about photosynthesizers, um, how much of that energy that's available is actually used um, or converted into organic molecules by those primary producers, and then how much of that energy is available to each subsequent trophic level. And as you can see from looking at this figure of relative energy content from one trophic level to the next, um, trophic efficiency is a fairly low number in just about every case. So most of the energy that is available at one trophic level is lost as you transfer it to the next trophic level. And there are a couple of reasons for that, which we'll look at as we move through the next couple of slides. But here is a representation of the same food chain that we were looking at previously. We've got primary producers uh, in this figure indicated here by our green algae. You can see that there's a tremendous amount of energy available uh, or stored in that trophic level. So we're looking at 20,000 plus uh, kilocalories per meter square per year, which is just the unit of uh, energy measurement that we're using here. At the level of the primary consumer, we've got our um, mollusks or our freshwater snails. You can see that's a dramatic decrease down to less than 5,000 uh, kilocalories per meter square per year. And then our secondary consumers, in this case, our sculpin, Again, a fraction of the energy that was available at the level of the primary consumer is now contained in the secondary consumers. And by the time you get to the apex consumer, in our case, the Chinook salmon, you are down to a very small percentage of what was originally available. So how is energy lost as you transfer from one trophic level to the next? So let's take a look at figure 46.8 from the OpenStax biology textbook. This uh, figure is showing us energy flow through an ecosystem in uh, Silver Springs, Florida. The data comes from this 1957 publication looking at energy flow through the system, and it's a little bit complicated, but the main idea that you should notice when looking at this figure is where uh, the energy loss is actually occurring. So we see sunlight energy entering the system uh, 1.7 million kilocalories per meter per meter squared per year total uh, influx of sunlight energy and the primary producers are able to use that energy and convert it into chemical energy in the form of photosynthetic products and you get this gross productivity here which is 20,800 or so um, kilocalories per meter squared per year. So this is gross productivity, as you'll notice down here, the blue indicates gross productivity. And again, that's just the amount of organic molecules or the amount of carbon that is fixed through photosynthesis in this system. Now, out of this 20,000 or so kilocalories of energy, you're going to lose about 13,000 kilocalories here through respiration and heat. So why is that? Well, if we think back to what goes on during cellular respiration, we are converting chemical energy in the form of glucose, in most cases, into ATP. But that's not an efficient reaction. The second law of thermodynamics reminds us that energy transfer reactions are ultimately inefficient. Um, and when we're converting glucose to ATP, in most cases we're looking at about a 60% loss 
of energy in the form of heat. So we are taking into consideration the gross productivity or all of the energy that the primary producers have been able to store up in the bonds of the organic molecules that they're building during photosynthesis. But then we have to subtract the amount of energy that is actually being used by the primary producers in their own metabolic processes during cellular respiration um, and the loss. So some of that energy is turned into ATP and some of that energy is lost as heat. So you are actually left with about 7,600 kilocalories of energy that is available to the next trophic level um, in line, so for our primary consumers. In order to make it easier to trace the energy flow through this ecosystem, let's put some labels on our trophic levels. So our primary producers, that's going to be our plants. Our primary consumers in this Silver Springs ecosystem, that's going to be herbivores like insects and freshwater mollusks like our snails from before. Our secondary consumers, these are going to be fishes that eat the insects or the snails. And then in this ecosystem, our tertiary consumers are also going to be fishes, just more predatory fishes, that are bigger fish that are eating smaller fish. So it's important to notice as we're moving up to our primary consumers that not all of the energy, so the 7,600 or so kilocalories of energy that is available um, in the tissue of the plants, so biomass available for consumption by the primary consumers or our insects, let's say, not all of that biomass is going to be consumed. So in this case, we have about 3,300 kilocalories of that available energy that's actually consumed by the um, primary consumers. Well, where does the rest go? Um, in this elegantly designed study, um, they are actually tracing the, the transfer of that energy to decomposers. So whatever the primary consumers don't eat goes this direction to ultimately be uh, decomposed and that energy and nutrient cycle continues in that direction. But what we really want to focus on here is um, the fact that at each trophic level you lose some energy. So we've got 3,300 or so kilocalories available. Um, again, you account for that part of that energy that is um, used by the primary consumers for their own metabolic processes, so lost as respiration and heat, um, which leaves approximately 1,100 kilocalories of energy available to the next trophic level, which is our secondary consumers, um, our first group of fishes. So out of that 1,100 that's available, about 383 kilocalories is actually consumed. Of that 303, 383 kilocalories that's consumed, you lose that 272, goes to respiration and heat, leaves you with about 111 kilocalories of energy available in the tissues or in the biomass of the fishes at that trophic level. As you move up to our apex predators or our tertiary consumers, they're consuming about 21 kilocalories of energy. Um, and again, you're losing about 16 of that to respiration. So total available uh, energy in the biomass of the tissues of the tertiary consumers is only about five. So the important thing to notice here, there are two important things to take away. Number one, that you are reducing the available energy at each trophic level. And also, why is it being reduced? It's being reduced because it's being lost through cellular respiration, um, either being turned into ATP and used for cellular functions or lost in that energy transfer um, as heat. So to sum it all up, let's take a look at a couple of uh, ecological pyramids. The ecological pyramid depicted on the left here in C, this is actually uh, adapted from a figure in the OpenStax biology textbook as well. It's figure 4610. Um, so part C is looking at an energy pyramid. This is exactly the same thing that we were looking at in the previous slide. You've got your plants or your primary producers at the bottom of the pyramid that has got the tremendous uh, amount of energy stored up in those tissues. 
You've got your primary consumer level here where you can see the energy available is reduced. Then you've got your secondary consumers and then finally your apex consumers. Um, so it's just, again, another way to depict energy um, and how it decreases as you go from one, t one trophic level to the next, to the next, and so on. So this one is specifically looking at energy, an energy pyramid. And again, this one is also accounting for uh, energy that goes to decomposers. So that's another way to illustrate the same um, flow chart that we were looking at previously. So I also want to take a second to look at a different type of ecological pyramid. So this is figure 4610A. Um, this is looking at biomass. This is an interesting concept as well. So biomass and energy tend to follow a similar pattern where the trophic level with the most energy available tends to have the most biomass. In this case, we're looking at our plants. So um, our units here are grams per meter squared. We're just looking at how much tissue is available at each one of those levels. So plants make up the vast majority of the biomass. Um, as you move from one trophic level to the next, in this case from our plants, our primary producers, up to our primary uh, consumers, you will lose a tremendous amount of biomass. You, that energy loss coincides with the loss of biomass because you have less available energy with which to build tissues. So you see the same decrease as you move up, um, up the trophic levels. So again, decrease in overall biomass at the secondary consumer level and a very small amount of biomass at the uh, tertiary level or the apex consumers. So there is a correlation between the available energy at each trophic level and the biomass that each trophic level contains. The important sort of summary to take away from this though is that trophic efficiency is generally a low percentage. Energy is lost at each trophic level as one organism consumes the next. Um, a rule of thumb is called the 10% rule and that just says that at each energy transfer from one trophic level to the next, about 90% of the available energy is lost. So about 10% of what was available at the trophic level below it um, shows up in the, in the next trophic level in line. So overall, trophic efficiency is uh, fairly inefficient and uh, a pretty low percentage.